is to see the nations worship. Our cry, our prayer is to sing your praise to the ends of the earth that with one mighty voice every tribe and tongue rejoices our heart our desire is to see the nations worship you our heart our desire is to see the nations worship our cry our prayer is to sing your praise to the ends of the earth that with one mighty voice every tribe and tongue rejoices our heart our desire is to see the nations worship you our heart our desire is to see the nations worship cry, our prayer is to sing your praise to the ends of the earth, that with one mighty voice, every tribe and tongue rejoices our Hey, good morning. Welcome to Twickenham. We're glad to have you here. Thanks for coming out to be with us today. If you're a guest, special welcome to you. If you are looking for a church home, we are always looking for new family members. And uh, there's a card in front of the, the seat right in front of you. You can fill that out and put that in the collection plate a little bit later on. If you'd like to sit down and have a conversation, uh, indicate that on the card. We'll give you a call this week and we can set up a time to talk. And uh, if you've got a prayer request, indicate that on there as well. Hey, I got to witness something pretty, pretty neat this past week. Um, I got to go out to um, near the airport and witness a reunion. And then that night, I got to see an even more special reunion on the news at 10 o'clock. Uh, and we've got a video of that, and I just want you to just to kind of watch the video here for just a second. Watch this neat reunion. Bomber. That's my favorite part when she goes, it's daddy. So. <laughs> hey, that's our own Rob Handley who spent the last 11 months overseas. He came back to his family this past week and he's back with us this morning right up here. Rob, welcome home, brother. We love you. Welcome home. Hey, let me invite you to stand with me, please, and uh, let's hear this scripture together. We just sang about the nations, and listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely, surely, surely I am with you to the end of the age. Let's sing together. 
Jesus, hope of the nations. Jesus, comfort for all who mourn. You are the source of heaven's hope on earth. Jesus, light in the darkness. Jesus, truth in each circumstance. You are the source of heaven's light on earth. In history you lived and died. You broke the chains. You rose to life. You are the hope living in us. You are the rock in whom we trust. You are the light shining for all the world to see. You rose from the dead, conquering fear, our Prince of Peace, drawing us near. Jesus, our hope, living for all who will receive, for we believe. Jesus, hope of the nations, Jesus, comfort for all who mourn. You are the source of heaven's hope on earth. Jesus, light in the darkness. Jesus, truth in each circumstance. You are the source of heaven's light on earth. In history you lived and died. You broke the chain. You rose to life. You are the hope living in us. You are the rock in whom we trust. You are the light shining for all the world to see. You rose from the dead, conquering fear. Our Prince of Peace, drawing us near. Jesus, our hope. Living for all who will receive. Lord, we believe. Lord, we believe. Lord, we believe. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me. All my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender all. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save, forever, off 
offer of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. You're my Savior. You can move the mountains. God, you are mighty to save. You are mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. You rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Remain standing as we read this morning. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Be seated as we take our offering. I'm laying down my life. I'm giving up control, I'm never looking back, I surrender all, I'm living for your glory on the earth. This passion in my heart, this stirring in my soul, to see the nations bow, for all the world to know, I'm living for your glory. On the earth, for the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me, light a flame in my soul for every eye to see. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. This passion in my heart, this stirring in my soul, to see the nations bow. For all the world to know, I'm living for your glory on the earth. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. Light a flame in my soul for every eye to see. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. For every knee to bow down. For every heart to believe, for every voice to cry out, burn like a fire in me. For every tongue to confess that you alone are the key, you are the hope of the earth, burn like a fire in me. Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The kingdoms of earth pass away one by one, but the kingdom of heaven remains. It is built on a rock, 
and the Lord is its King, and forever and ever remains. The tempest may rage, and the hurricanes roar, let the wind and the torrents descend, and the strong gates of hell may assail in its vain, for the kingdom shall stand till the it shall stand, it shall stand, the kingdom of heaven shall stand, it shall stand, it shall stand, forever and ever, amen, the kingdom will stand, the kingdom of God is now open to all, every sinner may now enter in, there's a welcome for all, who will turn to the Lord, full salvation and pardon for sin, it shall stand, it shall stand, the kingdom of heaven shall stand. It shall stand, it shall stand, forever and ever, amen. It shall stand, it shall stand, the kingdom of heaven shall stand. It shall stand, it shall stand, forever. Oh
I invite you to open your Bibles or power up your Bibles to uh, Ephesians chapter 2. And there's Bibles in the uh, rack in front of you there. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. I say open it because I think this passage would be a wonderful passage to um, meditate on uh, during the quiet time as the feet that bring the bread and the wine are passing among us. Uh, Ephesians 2.11. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies, not their hearts. So, like a lot of the songs we've been singing, the passages that have been read, this is Paul uh, dealing with uh, divisions. Verse 14, he's going to call it walls of hostility. Um, Outsiders, heathens, Gentiles. Uh, Sermon title is those people. It's a typo, right, Johnny? (laughs) The the sermon title is those people. Walls of hostility. Walls, there's plaster walls and wooden walls and uh, rock walls. But, but this passage, and, 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 there, and look at it, page, verse 14. He broke down the wall of hostility. Now, that's interesting. Um, a, wall, a wall of hostility. And um, now that, that's a wall that's movable. Uh, it's a wall you can throw up at any moment. It's easily erected, and in fact, it can be uh, it can be it can separate a lot of a lot of different rooms. And it's not like we have to stretch our mind very hard back to Paul's day to think what is meant by walls of hostility that separate people. Um, it's not like it doesn't happen about a hundred times in our day, in our hearts social media posts or news, news flashes or uh, one ch- news channel's on and you, I, I get some of that, turn one off and go to another and turn it off and the walls of hostility that I deal with, uh, peoples, politics, religion, nationalities, you name it, you name it, walls of hostility. Um, and, then, and then we get to, in this same passage where Paul's dealing with these these, these walls of hostility that separate us, separate us, divide us, that are walls in the heart, walls that divide us in the heart. And here's, here's the passage that I, I just want to shine a light on. Verse 16 of Ephesians 2. And I hope, I hope you've got it there in front of you because I want, I want you to look at it closely. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility toward each other was put to death. Just, just, look, at that, just look at that passage for just a minute. So, so we're talking about his death here on a Roman execution rack where they, they murdered him. <laughs> they knew he was innocent. And, and he, he died. But, but Paul says he killed something. That, that he made something else dead. He killed. He's the one who put something to death. And that's interesting, isn't it? By means of his death on the cross, our hostility toward each other was put to death. Hostility died. And somehow, apparently, Jesus believed that in allowing hostility to kill him, he allowed it to kill him. He he allowed the hostility in our heart to to kill him. Romans, Jews, huddled one side or the other. And their hostility, he permitted to kill him, somehow believing it would kill it. It would kill it, the hostility. 
And so I don't know what hostility you come with to this gathering or you deal with. I've got my own that I deal with. But this is the time, this is the place to deal with it, isn't it? He's, he's here, he's with us, and he put those hostilities to death. He, he put them to death. And so as we share his blood, his body, let's, let's bring that to him. Let's just bring those hostilities to him and, 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 and be honest. Let's be honest with ourselves. As we, as we share together, let's pray. Fathers, it's really hard for us to understand this. It's really hard. Um, thank you for Jesus, for the death he died, his upside down view of hostility, walls that divide, and how to deal with that in the way he absorbed into his own life, into his own person, his own body, uh, death, allowed it to, to kill him, to kill you. Help us, Father, as we honestly share here in this fellowship your remembrance, your reminder of your own life that we partake in as your, as your followers, and uh, help, us, help us, Lord, to deal with hostilities in our heart in these moments as we share. Just name, amen. In Jesus' name, and in Jesus' name, I come to you to share his love as he told me to. He said, freely, freely, you have received. Freely, freely, you have received. 
deeply grateful for the new humanity that we're a part of, that you've made us a part of, and that we're, that the hostilities, the wall has, has come down and you've, you've ended, you've de- taken away the divides. Um, remind us in this moment the cost, the cost it, it uh, meant to you to do that. Just, just help us, uh, Father, realize how deeply you love us, and how deeply uh, important these walls of hostility are, that they be taken down and help us, God, in these moments of reflection of Jesus and what it means to be a part of his body, participate in his body, share his blood as a family. Help us understand what that means. We need your help, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the as you 
walk with us. Speak, O Lord, till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize. To see the captive's hearts release, the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace. We lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church. We pray revive this earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray. Unleash your kingdom's power. Reaching the near and far, no force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts. You made this for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us, fill us with the strength and love of Christ. We are your church, we are the kingdom here let the darkness fear show your mighty hand heal our streets and land set your church on fire win this nation back change the atmosphere build your kingdom here build your kingdom Your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here. We pray. Be seated. So when Lisa and I were in college at uh, Fried Hardeman, it's a small Christian liberal, liberal arts school in uh, western Tennessee, we had a friend named Jeff. And Jeff was a very good athlete. He could play anything. Uh, but he was particularly good at uh, gymnastics. He was a star on the school's gymnastics team. He was also a really good student like really good student and he was an excellent musician a trombonist and according to all the girls he was really really good looking and I, I would have hated him for all of that uh, except that uh, he was already off the market he had been dating a girl named Mary for a very long time and in their junior year he proposed and she said yes and they were they were married I think it was somewhere between three and five months after they were married, uh, Jeff took a really bad fall in gymnastics practice and broke his neck. 
And I've thought about it. I thought about it then, and every time I remember the story, I think about it, and I, I try to put myself in his place or in hers and try to wonder what it was like, what, what the feelings were when doctors in, in Jackson, Tennessee, told them that Jeff was permanently paralyzed from the neck down. I mean, what words? Devastated? Shattered? Uh, Roger doesn't have enough words in his thesaurus to adequately describe what they must have felt. I've known, I've known heroic people, but no, none like Jeff and Mary. They summoned hope out of that despair. They finished their senior year uh, we had fundraisers the last year and a half. I remember uh, concerts and walkathons and selling stuff to raise money for a van and a, and a motorized chair. And um, I remember Jeff rolling across the stage to get his diploma and everybody cheering for him and for them. And just like the rest of us Bible majors at Freed Hardeman, Jeff was headed off right after graduation to his first pulpit minister tryout. We don't, when you're a preacher, you don't call them interviews, you call them tryouts, right? So he was going to go his first trial because he was going to be a preacher. And I don't, I don't remember which southern state that little church was in, but, but Jeff and Mary uh, drove their van into the parking lot and, and then unloaded Jeff, and they rolled up to the front door, and two men from the church came out to meet them. And they looked down at Jeff in that chair, and then they looked at Mary, and they said, well, this is not quite what we expected. And there was a pause, long, awkward. And then one of the men said, y'all should probably just get back in your van and head on home. This is not gonna work. You wanna just take a moment and get in touch with how that makes you feel? Angry, outraged, infuriated, sickened? Roger runs out of word for that feeling, too. I'll tell you more of that story in a little bit. We're, we're wrapping up our series this morning on, on Jonah, God's stubborn grace. Uh, chapter 4, if you want to look there, chapter 4 of Jonah. Here's a quick recap in case you've been missing or you haven't been fam you're not familiar with the story. God orders a Jewish prophet named Jonah to go to the people of Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria, and preach to them. That's, that's the nation that had conquered Israel. In other words, go to your enemy. And Jonah was disinclined to do so and decided to run in the opposite direction. And you know that decisions, you know this, right? Decisions have consequences. You know that. This week I watched an installment of Undeniable with Joe Buck, and he interviewed Michael Irvin, the great Cowboys wide receiver. And Irvin was like one of 16 children. And his dad used to tell, his dad was, uh, they called the Rev, uh, because he was a, a, a reverend on Sunday. Uh, and he worked throughout the rest of the week. Most preachers only work one day a week. The Rev worked on Sunday to preach and then worked the rest of the week at something else. The, the dad used to tell his boys, boys, being a man means that you make a decision and then you deal with the consequences. You make a decision, you deal with the consequences. And so when he was in the sixth grade, Michael Irvin went to his dad and said, Dad, I made a decision. I'm going to quit school. And his dad said, okay. And Irvin thought, man, that was easy. So the next morning, his dad knocked on the door at 5 a.m. And, and Irvin rolled over and said, Dad, I, I made a decision. I'm not going to school. And his dad said, yeah, that was the decision. Here's the consequence. You working with me today. And his dad was a roofer. Michael Irvin did three a days as an NFL professional. Three a days. He said, I have never had a day like that day with my dad. So the next morning, his dad knocked on the door again at 5 a.m. Irvin rolled over and said, Dad, I have made a different decision. I'm going to school. So God does something like that with Jonah. He uses some stubborn pagan sailors, a storm at sea, an enormous fish, all to prompt Jonah to reconsider his decision, which he does. He goes to Nineveh. He preaches the message God gives him. The entire city turns from their evil ways. They repent. And here's the important part. God made a different decision. 
God forgave Jonah's enemies. And so now we're ready for chapter 4. Let's hear it together. But to Jonah, this, this is the decision not to punish the enemies, seemed wrong, very wrong. And he became angry. And he prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. Tarshish was the town he was trying to run away to. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah doesn't even answer him. Jonah doesn't respond to that. Is it right for you to be angry? Nothing. Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city, and there he made himself a shelter, sat down in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Verses 6, 7, and 8 have a little sermon inside of them that we're not going to get to today, which is a pity. So I want you to really pay attention to 6, 7, eight, six, seven and 8. This is really interesting. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was happy about the plant. The Hebrew word for leafy plant is kudzu. Verse 7. <laughs> but at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. You know, the interesting thing about those three verses is that they all have the words, God provided in them. Why is it that we always think, here's the sermon that we're not going to get to today. Why is it that we always think that God's provision is for our comfort? We'll say, Lord, you know, thank you for my provision, or please provide, or we'll pray for the Lord to do something for us. And we always think it's for our comfort or, 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 or to make life easier. But for Jonah, it wasn't for his comfort. It was for his growth. It was so he would change. And I can tell you right now, growth and change are not comfortable. They're not fun. And yet, they are a part of God's provision. Okay, that was one sermon. Here's the rest of it. But God said to Jonah... Is it, now, same question he asked earlier, but he's a little more specific this time. Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? You know what's unfortunate? It's unfortunate that the book of Jonah has always been considered a children's story. I think it's been, that, it's been trapped in that genre for a very, very long time. Apparently that's what happens to Bible stories that feature fantastic animals. But this is anything but a children's story. This is a truly remarkable work, a remarkable product. Here's why. It emerged from a culture and a time worldwide in which tribalism, unquestioned loyalty to your group, was dominant. Nobody ever sent missionaries to convert their national neighbors. They sent militaries to conquer them. In those days, you didn't go evangelize the heathen. You wanted to exterminate the heathen and take their stuff. You wanted to enslave the heathen. And few nations were as tribal as Israel. And yet here's a story which comes from Israel where Israel's God sends one of Israel's prophets to preach to Israel's enemy and the prophet is angry about it, and Israel's God confronts him about his anger. There are a lot of folks who say that the Bible is a human product, that humans with agendas put words in God's mouth to justify their bloody deeds. I'm just not seeing that in Jonah. How this story got out there, I don't know, unless it's not from us. Jonah, the Jewish prophet, is sitting up there on a hill, 
in the hot sun, hoping and praying that God will go all Sodom and Gomorrah on Nineveh. He wants God to rain down fire and brimstone, and when God rains down grace instead, Jonah is angry about it, angry enough to die, because God wanted Jonah to kill those people. It's a good thing we're over that, right? We know that, I mean, we know that God does not favor any particular nation these days. We know that Scripture teaches that God wants all people everywhere to be saved. Go into all the world and make disciples. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and all that and all those verses like that. When we all get to heaven, we are not going to complain if it is heavily populated with people who did not grow up on grits and sorghum syrup. We're not going to complain if there are people up there who inexplicably down here drank Pepsi instead of Coke. Up there, it will not matter. Believe, some of you don't believe this, but it will not matter if you war eagle, roll tight, or go dogs down here. At that point, we'll just be so glad to be there that the demographic makeup of heaven won't matter. But demographics do matter here. Now, a lot, maybe seems like more than ever. To Jonah, the Ninevites were those people. So who are yours? Who are your those people? Maybe for you it's a skin color thing. Now you know good and well you can't say that. Because it's not culturally acceptable to exclude people based on skin color anymore, but it's what's in your heart. See, it's not, and, and that's not just a cultural sin, that's a spiritual sin. Not only will it get you in trouble at work, it'll get you in trouble with God. If you judge people by the color of their skin, you are jeopardizing your own red, yellow, black, or white soul. Look, God either doesn't care about skin color or he doesn't see skin color, or he just likes it. He likes the rainbow that is humanity because he sure made a lot of shades. God does see and care about soul condition, and his church should reflect his concern for all people regardless of which crayon God used to color them. Who are your, those people? Maybe for you it's an economic thing. Maybe you're uncomfortable around people who are richer than you are. Maybe you envy their lifestyle. You're intimidated by their abundance. You're suspicious of how they got it and what they're doing with it. Maybe you're a little bit jealous of their stuff. And maybe the truth is you're just a little bit mad at them because they have more than you do. Or flip that one around. Maybe you're, those people are poor. You suspect that they come to church with their hands out, that they want to be your friends because they want to know your, they want your stuff, that they're more interested in the stuff we have than the message we believe. And truth be told, they make you feel a little bit guilty for being in the top 20, 10, 5, or 1%. And you don't like feeling guilty, so. You know, one of the most scandalous features in the New Testament church was its socioeconomic diversity. You had slaves, the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder, sharing the Lord's Supper with Roman citizens. And back then, table fellowship was a way bigger deal than it is now. Crossing that line back then was like thumbing your nose at Jim Crow laws in 1950s America. How'd they pull that off? They realized, as the reformer Martin Luther once pointed out, that before God, we are all beggars looking for the next loaf of bread bankrupt every one of us. Who are your, those people? Maybe it's political for you. You see a pickup truck driving down the road with a Make America Great bumper sticker and you're like, God, those people. Or you see a Prius with a coexist bumper sticker and I'm with her and you're like, those people. Maybe the Bernie Sanders socialists or Trump's deplorables or Hillary's folks or maybe the people who listen to Rush Limbaugh or, your peop or, or those people or those people are people who listen to NPR. You know how those people are, right? 
Or maybe it's gender-based for you. I saw an article this past week called, It's Okay for Us to Hate Men. But there are just as many men who hate women because they're women. Or maybe for you it's gays or straights. Maybe it's a religious thing. You know how Muslims are, those people. Or maybe it's irreligion. You know how those atheists are, those people. Who, who are your people? Who, who, are those, who is your those people? And while you ponder that, while you think about that question and feel all uncomfortable with it, realize that somewhere somebody looks at you and goes, those people. And remember Jeff the gymnast? I left out a pretty significant part of that story. See, those two men who, who told Jeff and Mary to get back in their van and head on home were not turning him away because he was in a wheelchair. They, they knew about that before they met him. What they didn't know was that Jeff was black, Mary was white. That's why they said, this won't work here. Which kind of makes you want to go back to Roger's thesaurus and find some more words, right? Here's the difference between you and me and Jonah and God. We can't stand those people. God can't stand to let those people die in their sin. God loved the people of Nineveh, and he loved the prophet who hated them. God loved the two men who turned Jeff and Mary away from their broken little church, and God loves those of us who want to punch those two guys in the face. In the book of Revelation, God gave the Apostle John a vision. A vision is a picture of a desired future. Here's the picture of God's desired future. Revelation 21.3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. Our mission is to go to those people the people Jesus misses the most, whomever they are, whatever crayon God used to color them, however they voted, wherever they fall on the socioeconomic scale, and tell them about the God who wants to make them his people. See, that's our mission, because that was the mission of Jesus. That's what we must do for those people because that's what Jesus did for us. My, my effort in my own heart this week is going to be to try and get the Jonah out of me and get more Jesus in me. Now, that's, that's going to require some change. And change is scary. But if you're willing to go there with me, then we don't need to be afraid because God's already there. And wherever God is, it's safe. Let's stand, let's sing, and let's be like Jesus, not Jonah this week. We are not afraid to follow where you lead, leaving what we know for what we cannot see. We are not afraid so we are not alone, and so we'll go with you into the unknown. We are not afraid, we are not afraid to love the way you do, to serve with the same grace we receive from you. We are not to look beyond ourselves and offer hope to those who cannot help themselves. We are not afraid. We are not afraid. We will be fearless for you. Fearless for you. Step out.
out on the waves or walk through the flames. Whatever you ask us to do, we will be fearless for you. We are not afraid, though some say we should wait. The cost is just too high, the danger is too great. We are not afraid to move when you say move. Trusting in your voice, we will follow you. for you, fearless for you, we will be faithful in all that we do. If we step out on the waves or walk through the flames, whatever you ask us to do, we will be fearless for you, fearless for you. Be faithful in all that we do. If we step out on the waves or walk through the flames, whatever you ask us to do, whatever you ask us to do, whatever you ask us to do, we will be fearless for. Jody, thank you very, very much. Thank you for that, that message this morning, that challenge this morning. Uh, just a few things as we close. New member lunch coming up Sunday, June the 24th. These things are all in your bulletins. Directory pictures coming up. It's been two years. That takes place later in the summer. Uh, TCM, our children's ministry, we have a terrific Tuesday. This Tuesday at Southern Adventures, Water Slides and Games. Uh, Dinner and Devo continues and also, children's and youth, don't forget, Camp to Know Him is coming up, and we'll start reg registering for that very soon. And I know that he would not want me to say anything, but a uh, special prayer for Jody and Lisa. Uh, they have decided to take Lisa's dad into their care with his uh, dementia and his Parkinson's, and uh, many of us have known and continue to know the difficulties that that provides for day-to-day -day life when you take on that challenge, but that's the best thing for them at this point in time. And so keep them in your prayers and all those who are dealing with aging parents. Hey, thanks for being here. Great day today. Hope your day continues to be great as we close in prayer. Have a great week. Let's pray. Father's Dan reminded us you are here among us. And so as we get ready to leave, we ask you to help us dedicate everything that we do this week as a worship to you and help us to give you the glory and honor for all the good things that happen in our lives. We thank you for your son and what he endured so that we could ask for the forgiveness of our sins. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.